Okay. And now PowerPoint stopped playing nice. There we go. Okay. Now this is a series of commands that were found at the originally at the end of last week's lecture, but they, they kind of it's in a weird spot. It doesn't really fit anywhere, so we kind of just shoehorn it in wherever. And the first one is the grep command. The grep command, its purpose in life is actually search through files for strings and output if it finds it. <coughs> it's a really good way to keep track of what's happening on a, in a log file, if you're just looking for specific parts of a log file, or if you're looking for specific parts of a, um, of a file. Um, so what it, the way you usually do grep normally is you list the contents of a file or you output um, the results of a command like ls, and then you pipe it into grep. So the first couple of example here is they're out, take the contents of the FS tab and you're grepping for ext3. If I were to do that on my machine, nope, I didn't make this bigger. Um, I mean, you do that without so much noise on the screen. That's the content of the FS tab on my machine. If I were to go do this, but then I say pass that into grep, and I'm looking for ext4, it will only give me the two lines that found ext4 in it, which is handy because that way, if you're looking at a really large log file for an error, instead of looking through a log file that has thousands and thousands of lines, you can tell it just output the ones where you see a specific error or a specific IP address or <coughs> um, that kind of thing. Um, back when I was playing uh, hide and seek with uh, someone that was using an endpoint in the Netherlands, uh, I was spending a lot of time finding IP addresses that belonged to an ISP called Ziggo doing this exact thing. Uh, why was I looking for those IP addresses? So I could ban them. In the end, I ended up banning all of the Netherlands because Ziggo was their biggest ISP. It's as if I banned all of Bell in Canada. You know, different countries, different rules, and they allow anonymous everything, which sucks for security. Um, there's a few other parameters you can feed it. Uh, you can make it, you use dash i to make it case insensitive. Um, that means it won't care if it's uppercase, lowercase, mixed case, whatever. Um, Dash V is actually reverse. So it shows you everything that doesn't match the pattern. So if you're trying to exclude things, you can use dash V. Um, dash C tells you just how many times it was found. That's, a, that's an interesting one. Um, two. So instead of showing me the lines, it just tells me, I found this pattern twice, which essentially is what I was doing with uh, when I was trying to match those IP addresses, I was trying to see which IP addresses were hitting our server repeatedly doing things they weren't supposed to be doing. And I was crawling through the log files and I wanted counts. So what happens is normally on our servers, if somebody goes to register their software, there'll be three to six hits from their IP address. When I start getting 75, 80 from one IP address, that means they're up to something. So I set up a rule that said, you know, if this IP show address shows up more than X number of times in today's log, poop, they're gone. And dash n shows you what line was it found on. So if it's a really long log file, or some people use this to find source errors in source code. <coughs> you want to find out how many times a given function was called in your source code. You could use this and it would tell you how many times it was used, found, or you could do dash n, it will show you the line number in each file where that function was. Um, you guys haven't really dealt with large code bases. Um, when you start dealing with an application in the tens of thousands of lines of code or in the, you know, upwards of tens of thousands, 
Um, like the main application where I work is something like 200,000 lines of code. Minimum. Last I heard. Not without any of the extra stuff. And you try to find where a certain function is used everywhere in that. Visual Studio is good. It kind of sucks sometimes, though, for finding specific things in it. And we actually have some people that actually use all the Linux tools to actually find where certain pieces are. So they're trying to figure out where certain functionality has been implemented in the code. They'll actually do a find and then a grep to find all the... They'll output the file name and the line number and all that jazz. It's really handy. Okay. The next item that doesn't really fit into any given talk pick is the Brace expansion. Now, how many people... Oh, actually, all of you have looked at PHP now, but you probably haven't learned about Brace expansions in PHP. Uh, I don't even know if you're even going to learn about Brace expansion in PHP. It's like the best feature ever. Um, Brace expansion allows you to um, create a list. So let's say you want to create three files at once. So instead of typing in the touch command three times, you could actually go braces and comma delimit the file. So you could literally go touch file one, file two, file three, and issue it as a single command. It'll actually do it three times. Um, you can almost think of it as an array but it's an array you can use at the command line. So you can feed it a whole series of parameters and it'll create all the matching uh, subdirectories. And it gets really, really fancy. I'm going to actually grab this command to show you just how powerful this is. I already suck. I can't even type. I'm trying to type the command exactly as it's, as it's written there. Okay, what are the odds I actually typed it in right? So, one command created that entire directory structure. Breeze expansion is really, really nifty. Um, it is something that you don't have on Windows. Even with PowerShell. PowerShell kind of has this, but it doesn't do it very well. So if you need to actually build up a complex directory structure that matches out a specific layout, this is how you do it. So <coughs> as you can see, it created the old directory and one of everything, and then a new directory, one of everything inside of it. So it's basically looping through each of the braced elements, creating each of them. and so it basically starts from left to right. It'll look at old, it'll create the old, and then it'll look at all the arguments past that, and it'll create the two sets of directories there. Then it'll do new and create the two sets of directories there under that. It's not something you'll do very often, but it's a really handy piece of functionality, especially if you're working with a lot of files. Or if you are trying to implement a... Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, a standardized directory structure. For example, if I gave you guys that command at the start of the term, we had a new and an old folder with all your labs all set up with all the different steps that you needed for each lab. I could run one command and say, you guys copy paste this into your shell and run this. It'll set up your directories for all your labs in one go. It's kind of handy. And then there's wildcard characters. Okay, you can think of this pretty much like the like statement in SQL, but of course the characters are completely different. Um, the star matches zero or more characters in a file name, so that's just like the percent sign in SQL. 
The uh, question mark is like the underscore in the like statement, which matches one character, and there has to be a character. It's not zero or more. It matches one and only one. When you use the square brackets, um, it'll match one of anything in that list. And of course, it's not comma delimited. It treats each character individually. <coughs> it'll do A, E, D. And it'll match one character regard as long as it's A, E, or D. If you do uh, A dash D, that'll be anything between A to E. So it's a range. And then the exclamation mark basically is uh, not match. So these are essentially regex expressions, very simple regular expressions. Um, I don't really have any really easy examples off the top of my head other than I could uh, theoretically go, if I do ls, oh, let me clear the screen first. So I want to look for anything that starts with ls, and I go anything that starts with l, it'll output only anything it found with l. Uh, I could also go anything that's bl, so it'll match anything that has, starts with b, or starts with l, and everything else after the fact doesn't matter. So you can do some fairly fancy pattern matching with this at the command line. <coughs> Um, and as you can see, most of it uh, worked now. Some of you are going to wonder, why is there some in here that started with F and E? That's because the Lecture 2 folder starts with an L. Backup starts with a B, so I told it anything that starts with B or L. I could give it the full range, and then it would pretty much find everything from B to L. Okay, so those are the two random slides that don't fit in anywhere. They're just useful things to know. Um, today we're going to talk about the Linux file system. I'm going to keep going through these slides until I hit slide 36, which talks about uh, FDisk. And I don't think I have the energy to actually explain FDisk today. So, but that's a way down the road. A file system is a collection of directories and files. You guys are, should understand what a file system is by now, I hope. You all have one on your computers. Windows ha uses NTFS. You used to use something called FAT, which stood for a file allocation system, uh, table. Now they're ca it's called NTFS, which is the uh, new technology file system. It's not new technology anymore. That's been around for like 15 years, but it was new. Uh, Macs use whatever the hell a Mac uses. <coughs> it's a um, it's a Unix file system of some sort, and there's other operating systems, different ones. But essentially, a file system is a way of storing directories and files. Um, a file system, which is strangely enough, does not need to exist on only a single hard drive. And I'm not talking about RAID, which is something you probably learned in Computer Essentials. With certain file systems, you can actually create a file system that spans multiple disks. Um, so you can actually basically stripe across multiple, like, like RAID 1, but not. Uh, you can just keep growing it across multiple disks. Um, a single hard disk can contain multiple file system. So that's if you have multiple partitions, you can have multiple file systems. So do anybody here using a Mac with boot camp? No? Nobody's paying attention. If you have a Mac and you use boot camp, your hard drive has actually been divided into two par sets of partitions. One for Windows, one for Mac. And uh, people that like writing Windows and Linux side by side will also do that. They'll have partitions for Windows and partitions for Linux, running on the same computer. One drive, no problem. That used to be the way we did it. Um, or like I said, a single file system is going to be spread acro across multiple hard disks. Now, Linux is a little special, <coughs> as in it stores information about each file in a structure called an inode. An inode has a unique number. It's called the inode number, surprise. You can think of it as an auto-incrementing primary key. 
in a database. So if you're using something like a big serial in Postgres or an auto increment in MySQL or an identity in uh, SQL Server or IBM DB2, these are keys that auto increment. The inodes automatically auto increment. And the problem is though with Linux, and this is actually one of its biggest issues, <coughs> when you create a file system, it has a set number of inodes. It has a lot of inodes, but depending on the size of the disk, you have a limited number of inodes. And when a file is created, it grabs the next inode number and assigns it to the file. And information about that file is written into the inode table, essentially. So it tells it, you know, this file is found at these, at this location on the hard disk. That's what it's called, et cetera, et cetera. When a file is deleted, what it does, it removes its inode information and marks the inode number as, as empty. So the file doesn't actually get deleted. It just basically is telling the computer, this file is no longer available to you. This file does not exist. It's there. And surprisingly easy to recover if you know what you're doing. But essentially all it does, yes. No, what happens is basically, this is the same problem the old <coughs> DOS and the old Windows, like Windows 95's file systems, the problems it had was whenever you deleted a file on those also, basically it says, you know this space that's used by this file, it's available. So basically it tells the Linux file system, you know what? This inode is available, you can write back into it all you want. Except for the fact that, you know, there's already data there and it just overwrites that data. But as far as the operating system is concerned, there's nothing there. The data is there, but as far as the operating system is concerned, there is nothing there. Um, that's why there's recovery tools to recover deleted files, and it's surprisingly easy to recover files off because it, instead of actually looking at the tables, it actually crawls through the, you know, the, the actual binaries of the disk and finds everything that's been delimited. <coughs> a Linux file system cannot create a new file unless there's an available inode for it, which is a, one of the big problems that used to happen on older Linux file systems is if you had a lot of small files, so you had a pretty big disk and a lot of small files, like a bunch of 1K files, you could actually run out of inodes. So you could actually have a, say, a terabyte drive. I know by today's standard, a terabyte drive is not that big, but there once was a time that was actually really big. And you're suddenly sitting with 500 gigs worth of data and you've run out of space. You can't create new files because you ran out of inodes. Um, some of the modern file systems actually allocate more inodes, but you cannot create new inodes. If you run out, you can't say to it, hey, give me a bunch of new inodes. You can't do that. You're just out of inodes. So you want to take those files and move them off the disk to somewhere else. So the inode numbers are stored in something called an inode list. Um, I know numbers are specific to a single file system. <coughs> so if you have multiple partitions, each partition has its own inode list. So you're not going to run out of inodes if you're working across multiple partitions, but you will run out of inodes if everything's stored in one partition, eventually. Um, if you actually want to know what the inode number is of a file, you can do an ls-i. So I did an ls-i for ls-out, and it shows that its idone number is 397,311. That's its magic number. Um, backup is 391,988. Actually, that's the contents of it. So the two files in there is 988 and 981. Why is it picking those numbers? I have no idea. It just grabs whichever one it wants. Odds are I deleted files at one point and those were marked as available, so it's then crawling through and grabbing those previous uh, items. If I did an LS like this, no, nope, it's ignoring me. Uh, 
Um, you can see all the different inode numbers on that. So a file system is a logical means for the OS to store and retrieve data. So in other words, the operating system needs a file system. Otherwise, it does know how to read and write files from a disk. Uh, every operating system has its own series of commands. On Linux, we've already explored some of these. <coughs> Touch, copy, move, remove, remove directory. So the operating system provides a set of tools for you to play with the files. Um, and every operating system offers these on every file system. So if you're working with an operating system, let's go with a really old one, uh, OS2. It was a great operating system when it came out. It was a partnership between IBM and Microsoft. We all know how well that always goes when those two start playing together. It never goes anywhere. Uh, essentially, everybody who's running Windows 10 is running OS 2. Because I, Microsoft took their portions of OS 2 and called it Windows NT. Windows NT became Windows XP, then became Vista, and became, you know, 7, 8, 10. <coughs> <coughs> and these are some of the commands that are provided. Every operating system has equivalents to these. Windows uses copy, move, Dell. <coughs> um, shoot, that's just what I was talking about. These basic functions are common to most operating systems. Uh, they also do it quite differently. Um, even if you use operating systems that are similar. So for example, Linux and Mac OS under the hood are similar. Because Mac OS is based on Unix. Linux is based on you know, Unix-like concepts. Most of the commands are quite similar, but there are still some differences in how they behave. In Windows, the commands are completely different. Uh, if you do some other op operating systems, they'll also be quite different. <coughs> in Linux, the concept of a file is simple. It's just a sequence of bytes written on the disk. So everything on Linux is a file. And Unix is the same way. So technically on a Mac, everything is a file. Network cards are a file. Hard drives are a file. Keyboard printers, everything is a file. Directories are also files. It treats it all. Basically, you got the inode table. The inode table says, these are the files I've got. <coughs> How those files are treated is where things vary. Um, now, there's some common ground between Linux and other operating systems. Like most OSs, Linux maintains a hierarchical file system structure. It's an upside down tree. So in other words, you've got the root. And then you know it spreads out below it from there. Um, all visible file systems, directories, and files are part of one main directory known as the root on Linux. Uh, in Windows, it's C colon backslash. Um, on Linux, a, the root file system usually has its own partition and contains all the information the system needs to run. Other <coughs> file systems, whether they're remote, local, or not, are mounted as subdirectories of the root. And so essentially everything below root, whether or not it's actually even on the same disk, is mounted there. So, technically on Linux, there's no maximum depth to the directory structure. <coughs> In Windows, years ago, we actually had a limit how far down you could go. But it's not the number of directories down you could go. It was the maximum length of the path, <coughs> which meant anything from C could not be more than 255 characters. So you could have directory A, then directory B, directory C, directory D. And that you could actually go 255 directories deep. But if you had a directory with, say, 25 characters in its name, and then a subdirectory with 25 characters in its name, then you'd be limited how far down you can go because of the length of the path. <coughs> <coughs> so 
Linux and Unix operating systems don't have that limitation. But essentially, you have a reverse tree. It looks like the root's coming out from the bottom of a tree. Linux predefines certain directories. Every Linux operating system will have these. And pretty much every Unix-like operating system will have these. <coughs> oh, I'm dying. <laughs> so, slash, every Linux operating system has added its root directory. All Linux operating systems also have one called root, which is where the root user lives. Bin is where most of the essential commands are. Sbin is where the administrative tools are contained. So most users have permissions to read and execute files out of bin, but only administrative class users can run programs out of sbin. Slash boot is where the kernel is located. Now the kernel is basically the, the heart of the Linux operating system. It's the very first thing that's loaded after the operating system kicks in. The kernel allows the rest of the operating system to talk to your hardware. So it basically take, it's the mediator between your hardware and the rest of your computer. And dev is your device files. Like I said before, everything in Linux is a file. Technically, your keyboard is a file. Your mouse is a file. Another hard drive is a file. And they're all found under dev, which stands for devices. A couple of other important directories, etc. I don't know why they called it etc other than it's etc, which is actually one of the most important directories. It has all the configuration files. <coughs> slash var contains administrative files, such as log files. Uh, Postgres, when you install Postgres on Linux, for example, it creates a directory under var to contain the data files. Not the entire install is there, but basically it's files that are that it writes the data into or stored under there. Basically, it stands for variable data, slash var. Because log files change all the time, database files change all the time. Um, mail folders are usually under there, too, so email, that kind of thing. Home is where, well, home is where home is. Uh, lib is basically where your binaries are, the executable libraries for each of the programs. Um, under Windows, that'd be the Windows backslash system32 folder. If you ever open up that folder, there's a bunch of DLL files in there. Don't delete that. Don't, don't do that. You're going to kill your computer instantly. <coughs> you will kill Windows and they will hate you forever. Uh, you will actually literally have to wipe and reinstall your computer if you do that. Um, slash proc is a folder that allows the file system to be accessed by running processes. So processes are like services in Windows or various programs. When you load up Task Manager, <coughs> when you load up Task Manager in Windows, um, and you look at all the different programs that are running, those are all processes. Linux has processes also. And it has a lot of processes. Uh, clear. <coughs> so, these are all the processes that are currently running on my VM. Some of them are dead, some are zombied. Uh, this is showing you know, some pieces of VMware running inside of it. This is my graphics display. That's my login manager. That's the networking thing to make sure the network actually works. So these are all processes. And each of the pr these processes can access the file system and it goes through something called slash proc. So it'll open up a special folder in there, or a special file that allows it to bypass <coughs> and talk to the rest of the operating system. <coughs> so, file names. Most modern Linux file systems allow you to have 55, 255 character long file names. It doesn't limit how many directories you can have, but each of them are limited to 255 characters. And why? 256 bits. 
sorry, 256 bytes. Um, you can use almost any character you want in a file name. Uh, however, there's certain things you shouldn't do. <coughs> Don't put spaces in your file names on Linux. You're not going to have a nice time. It's actually the same on Windows. If you ever do command line on Windows and you have space in your file names, you'll notice Windows will put quotes around your folder names. Same deal. On Linux, you either use quotes or you have to backslash. You have to escape your spaces. So if I were to make a directory called um, right, so now if I go Uh, yeah, there's Hello World. There's my director for Hello World. However, if I were to go, that won't work because Hello does not exist. So you either have to escape the space, <coughs> which looks pretty terrible, or you have to put quote marks around it, which is also kind of terrible. Actually, I'm already in there. So that works too. But you're going to end up having problems when you write scripts and stuff because scripts use quote marks too and they do different things in there. All right. The extension is part of the file name followed by a period. You guys should know what these are. At least Windows users know what they are. <coughs> .txt, .java, .doc, .docx. Mac users actually suffer from, I don't know what an extension is, because Macs ignore extensions. <coughs> That's annoying. File names that start with a period are hidden. We already covered that. Um, and we already talked about working directories. OK. Geez, they show up. I'm almost done. All right, file types. We already covered some of this, so I'm going to go through it fairly quickly. Uh, file types, there's simple or ordinary files. That's just a file. Directories, it's a directory. A symbolic link. <coughs> a symbolic link is like a shortcut to another file. A little more uh, intense than that, but basically you can create a link that points to another file and they basically coexist. Special files, such so as devices, and pipes, such as that allow first in, first out, so you can actually pipe your output into another program. Ordinary files are st store information. They can be source code, executable programs, that kind of thing. Um, there are no naming conventions. I already said you can go up to 255 characters. Extensions mean nothing to Linux. It doesn't care. So you could create a .cpp file, but it's actually a Word document. Linux doesn't care. <coughs> it means nothing. Uh, however, some programs require extensions because it uses those extensions to figure out what it is you're opening. So a word processor, such as OpenOffice, will look at the extension. If it sees .doc, it assumes it's a Word document. Two files with two different extensions, yes. Two files with identical names, no. The whole thing is treated as a uniqueness. So if the file is abc.txt, you can only have one of those in the folder. <coughs> but you have abc.txt and abc.doc, then you can have those side by side. That's OK. Just like in a database where you can't have a primary key twice in a given table, you can't have the same table twice in the same database. <coughs> same idea. All right. A directory is a named file container. It's literally a file. And it contains other files. So essentially what happens is it's not actually, it doesn't actually contain these files, but it has <coughs> Each of the files point to another directory.
All right, I'm almost done in more than one way. Link files is the next one. Link, symbolic links, soft links and hard links are the magic in Linux. It's a file that points to the contents of another file. So <coughs> you can use it to share the file, but it doesn't duplicate its content. I will actually uh, show you guys an example in a second. So a soft link is basically a path. So the closest thing you'll get in Windows, I gotta be careful when I word this because Windows has actually symbolic links also. Uh, we just don't use them because they're dangerous in Windows. It's like a shortcut. You know what, you have a shortcut to a program on your desktop, you double click on the shortcut and it launches the program. Even though <coughs> the shortcut doesn't contain the program, it just points to the program. Symbolic links do the same thing. But you can make it point at directories also. <coughs> okay. A text editor that accesses a symbolic link will be directed so it acts on the old file name. So <coughs> when you ls, it shows the symbolic link file name. But when you actually edit, it actually modifies the destination file. And a hard link is, instead of a path, it's actually connected to the inode instead. So if you do a hard link, you can rename the file. And the operating system doesn't care that you rename the file. So it's as if, um, think about your SIN numbers here in Canada. A soft link refers to you by name. A hard link refers to your SIN number. So even if you change your name, we're still connected to you. <coughs> That's the best example I can give you. And A file can have multiple hard links. They can also have multiple soft links. Um, when you create a hard link, it actually gives another inode number to the hard link. And it's essentially the same command as the soft link, except you tell it that it's not soft, it's a hard link. So if you make any changes to old file name or new file name in this case, it doesn't make a difference which one you edit because you're actually modifying the same file. You're just giving multiple ways to get at the same file. Now, before I continue with that, give me a second to regroup here. This is most commonly used for th two purposes. Purpose number one is for having um, independent library versions. So for example, you have a, a library on, the s on your computer that's version <coughs> 1.4. And every program refers to this as libabc.so. A libabc.so is not the actual file, it's a link that points to the file. So if you change the version number on the file, the link to the actual library name doesn't change because it's pointing to the file, not. So you're basically giving it a different name. That's purpose number one. Purpose number two is for configuration files. So often when you have um, complex web server environments, you'll have the sites that are available and the sites that are enabled, and you can cut, by creating a symbolic link in the enabled sites, it'll turn on which ones are, even though there could be more than one site available, only the ones that are in the enabled site will work. <coughs> Let me just go and uh, so. 
on my web server at work, this is the mods, modules that are available to our web server. So these are all the different plugins it has. These are the mods that are available. If I go into Now, these are the ones that we actually have turned on. And these are symbolic links. You can s let me make that a little bit bigger. And you'll see that they each of those files actually points to another file. So these are symbolic links. So access compat.load points to you know, in another directory that file. So instead of making a complete copy of the file, we're actually just making a symbolic link to that file. <coughs> so the web server knows what's been turned on, but the, ch the configuration is shared between both directories by using a symbolic link. It's a, s a way to make sure that you don't have misconfigurations anywhere. Because if you're only changing configuration on one file, you only need to do it in one place. <coughs> Just like when you write Java code, uh, processes that you do regularly or functions where you have a lot of the same code, you want to isolate that into its own function so you only need to fix it in one place. Um, so when you use a hard link, renaming the file doesn't affect the other file. Magic. Um, deleting one of the two files will also not affect the other one. So when you use a hard link, <coughs> both files point to the same spot. So you can delete either one, and the other one still works. With soft links, if you delete the destination file, the soft link stops working. You have a broken soft link. And there are parameters for copy for that. Dash D copies a soft link. Dash L copies a hard link. On Linux file systems, there's also special files. It's how it's you access the hardware. Um, <coughs> each hardware device is associated with at least one special file. And there's a command or application to access a special file in order to access the corresponding device. So the keyboard is a special file. The program goes through that file to get to the keyboard. It's kind of cool. Um, let me try that again. So this is the contents of my VM's dev directory. In here, there's a couple of interesting ones. CD-ROM points to the CD drive. <coughs> CDRW also points to CD drive. But some of the more important ones are the ones that start with S. SDA is hard drive number one. SDB would be hard drive number two. When you see SDA1 and SDA2, those are partitions. RTC stands for real-time clock. Whenever you ask Linux what time it is, it actually asks that file. That file then reaches into your motherboard and asks the real-time clock on your motherboard, what time is it? <coughs> Everything that starts with TTY is a serial device. Way back here. These were like the old dumb terminals. The old serial mice when you had a mouse with a big plug, plug in the back of your computer. Mice had balls back then. They weren't neutered yet. So, you know, uh, hey, you're going to remember that at least. But what was really cool is using the TTY port, you could actually send commands to the mouse and get commands back from the mouse, which was nifty. <coughs> totally useless, but it was cool. Um, there's a few others in here. Um, mem is actually a map to the memory in your machine. Um, yeah, just pretty much the big ones in there. Net points to the networking devices, that kind of stuff. Then there's three in there called STD error, STD in, STD out. Those are the three files 
that deal with redirecting input and output from your uh, command line. <coughs> Any uh, command that outputs data, so when I go ls slash dev, it's actually taking the command and sending it to standard out, std out. I could actually go, I could actually take in a command and redirect into it, and that's coming from standard in. And then standard error is when there's an error. Errors go here. Um, character devices and block devices is pretty much one of the last topics for today. Uh, character devices and block devices are a way to character. So a character device transfers data character by character. <coughs> Again, if you think about the old screen computer, the old green screen computers, the ones that were really slow, you could actually see it draw the screen line by line. Now, those of us of a certain vintage remember modems. And we remember hitting a really shitty connection. And you connect to your BBS, and your BBS, that's before the internet, by the way, would redraw, you'd actually see it draw the screen line by line as it was transmitting each character. That's a character device. It transmits data character by character, one character at a time. <coughs> block device is basically copy binary data. Your hard drive is a block device. Your graphics card is a block device. And just to give you an idea how old these things are, these slides are, slash dev slash fd zero, floppy disk zero back when we had floppy disks. So we could read and write out of FD0. That's how we'd write, read and write out of a floppy disk. Or we could actually go ls-l dev input mouse 0. And that would actually read the, res the input from your mouse. So you could actually list what your mouse is doing, which is kind of cool. <coughs> I'm going to skip that. And I think, yeah. Actually, I'm not even going to make it to 36. You guys are done, are tired of listening to me cough. And I'm tired of coughing. <coughs> so I'm going to pick up from here next week. I'm only stopping like three slides early, so it's not so bad. I just got to remember where I stopped next week. So that's I'll be talking about partitions next. Um, I am going to lab after this, so, you know, I'll be there. I will stop coughing by then. It's just I spoke so much that my throat's done. And um, 